are going to call the December 10th, 2018 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by Commissioner Gibbs, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you can. As we join here this evening, may we offer gratitude for waking up, for having a roof over our head, and food on our tables. May we give blessings for each person that speaks. May those that speak do so with integrity. May those that listen do so with an open mind. May we not judge. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, special agenda item tonight. I see many members from the library board here. We are going to kick it off with the presentation of a check from the Boji Group to the Royal Oak Public Library. So I see Mr. Boji is here, Mr. Line Weber, Ms. Carsoner and crew. Mr. Mayor and uh, Commissioners, I've been up here on more than one occasion, and um, I've truly been blessed to be in business for 20 years. My father and I started this company in uh, May of 1998, and we've been extremely blessed with um, what's taken place over those 20 years. We have numerous development agreements across the state of Michigan with multiple municipalities, We've been able to give back to those municipalities in a variety of ways, whether they are bricks and mortars, whether they are jobs that are created, um, or whether it's giving dollars that are necessary for causes. But when our 20th anniversary came earlier in the year, I, I really wanted to do something a little special that made a difference. So we reached out to three specific communities. Of course, um, our landmark community and where our business started is in Lansing at the state capitol. So that was, a, um, that was my first thought and how to give back. Uh, my second thought was a, a community that is in need that um, we've been able to do some very successful developments, and that was in the city of, of Kalamazoo. And then as I thought very thoroughly through the multiple communities that we've done business with, and the communities that we are doing business with. Obviously, Royal Oak came to my mind almost as much as, as Lansing. But in Royal Oak, I, I looked to, um, to you, and I reached out to your city manager. I reached out to the inner circle of your organization, and I said, where can we make a difference? And this difference is not only today, but is really the first step of many differences. And I was very pleased to hear that our neighbor was in most need of where the dollars could be spent. And I remember very well my vice president of construction, Mike Lineweber, saying to me years ago when we first were thinking about a development that his children would go to the library and always wonder, why, why don't we go through the front door of the library? I never understood really what that all meant. And I don't want to get my, my, uh, uh, my directions off. This is the north side entrance, and it has been closed for roughly 12, 13 years, 12, 13 years uh, almost as old as his children. So in turn, I said, okay, how can we make a difference? And with knowledge of what's taking place with our city center development, with the new parking deck, the new office building, city hall, police headquarters, I then learned that the north side of the entrance was trying to be opened up again for uh, patrons to, to easily have access to come in. But there was one item missing. And in these colder days, we all are aware that when you walk through a door, there is a gust of wind. And there's only really one way to stop that gust of wind. There's a vestibule. 
but there wasn't a budget available for that vestibule. So I said, it'd be our honor to be able to give back to the community, specifically the library, and people to be able to walk in in an environment that's very uh, educational, um, very refreshing, and warm as they walk in. Mm -hmm. So I was informed that it was missing a vestibule. And I said, how much is that vestibule? And they told me the amount. And I said, ironically, that's exactly what I'd like to give you. So we give you a $10,000 check for you, the library, and however you see fit. And you see fit for a vestibule that is just at $10,000. <laughs> so from my family to your family, congratulations. And let it all be a perfect and wonderful environment. that um, Thank you. this doesn't get cashed. I thought it was <laughs> cashed. <laughs> but I gave her the actual check before it started. <laughs> if that's a dry erase board, you could add another you can, uh, <laughs> well, well, by accident, I made a comment to Mr. Johnson, your city manager, and he goes, Ron, that's on record. <laughs> and it was with an extra zero. But thank you. And if I am correct, you're going to be starting when and ready and... Well, um... I, I, I deeply appreciate this donation. The library board and I have been working for a couple years to get that entrance reopened. It coincides with the sidewalk and the crumbling steps being redone just recently in the last six weeks to two months. Um, and I've invited the uh, members of the city appointed library board of trustees who are our volunteers who um, govern the library. And I will let Stacy Woodward, who is the president of that group, um, say a couple words. But this is Stacy Woodward, Roxanne Plater, Brandon Colo, Mark Walton, and Melanie Macy are the ones present here tonight. So again, we're deeply appreciative of the um, funds that allow us to do that. And I will let Stacy have a couple words. A little awkward. Do I talk to you? Do I talk to you? Uh, again, I'm Stacey Weber. I'm president of the Royal Oak Public Library. On behalf of the board and the director, the staff, and most of all the community, we thank you for this generous donation that sh that will increase access to our amazing library. So, and we hope you all come by soon. You can use the back entrance while this one is getting um, set up. So, thank you again. Our pleasure. Get around the middle and yeah, very good. By the sign the or or yeah, yeah. So I'll get you right there. Maybe come on in. Yeah. Mary. No, I want to be on there. Yeah. Yep. I'll be the only one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll be perfect then. And always got to take a safety with the cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> What a world. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boji, and thanks Thank to the you. Boji Group, and of course, uh, many thanks to Mary Karshner for her years of service helping make our library <laughs> one of the best uh, in the region, and of course to the trustees that volunteer their time uh, to make the library the amazing place that it is. Thank you very much. How about one more round? For the trustees, for the Boji Group. Exciting things going on everywhere you turn. All right, this brings us to item number five, which is the presentation of the Main Street grants to Royal Oak business recipients. Mr. Cameron's here, I see. Members of the uh, City Commission, uh, for those who uh, don't know me, my name is Sean Kammer. I'm the downtown manager. I work for the DDA. And uh, we're here before you tonight to actually present um, Rich Lockwood, who's the owner of Motor City Gas, with uh, our first ever uh, Main Street Genesis Grant Award. Uh, as all of you may be aware, 
The uh, DDA had joined the Oakland County Main Street program earlier this year. Uh, I believe it was April of 2018. And with that comes along uh, a series of benefits. One of them is access to the Genesis uh, Spirit of Main Street Award grant. Um, we've had five applications from local businesses. It's a $2,500 grant. Uh, it's a matching grant as well. Our first awardee uh, that uh, Genesis Credit Union and Oakland County Main Street have awarded is uh, Motor City Gas. And up here presenting it is uh, Brett Razigan from Oakland County. We have our county commissioner, Dave Woodward. Uh, we have Rich Lockwood from Motor City Gr Gas and uh, two representatives from Genesis Credit Union, uh, Megan Zarr and Linda Zabig. And uh, did, uh, Brett, did you wanna take it from here and maybe say a few words about Oakland yeah. County Main Street? Okay. Thanks. Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, we greatly appreciate that Royal Oak is back in Main Street, Oakland County. You were in one of our original towns and then out for a while, and you're, you're back again. Uh, this is a great business. It's a great grant program that Genesis has provided. The, uh, the city also is going to receive money, a grant from Flagstar Grant, to help fund the uh, repair work to the Veterans Memorial. So that's another program. We're offering two travel scholarships to the DDA to attend the National Conference in Seattle. We held, I believe it was four uh, uh, lunchtime business workshops here in the downtown in July. We are contributing to the Alley Design Project as well financially, so we're, we're very engaged. Sean is great to work with, and we're, we're very, uh, very excited to be back, uh, back involved with, uh, with Royal Oak. Um, Linda? Sure. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're very excited to honor, um, we're, but one thing we did find out is he has Christmas gifts. So, <laughs> you know, if you wanna do some shopping, he said he's got some great Christmas gifts. But we're very excited to join Main Street Program and honoring and supporting our local businesses that do business in local. If we support local, shop local, we're all in a better place. So we're happy to help you. So I'm going to take a picture, but I have a question. Would, would you mind standing if we put you right here? Could we take a picture with all of you guys? Absolutely, we can. I can speak for myself. <laughs> well, you're center, so that will be good. <laughs> yeah, you want us to come right down here in the front? Yeah. If you could, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. I'm coming. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. 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 All of you guys get to join in. Yep. Okay. Everybody gets to join in. You guys are all good. Everybody's there. Well, I did have you scoot in one, but I can't have one of us. Okay. We're going to go for it. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, Oakland County and Royal Oak and Genesis Bank. Uh, this is great. I think it's great for uh, small businesses in general, and we're very appreciative as a uh, family grassroots business that uh, you know hasn't had a lot of expendable money to spend on uh, marketing programs, and I think this one uh, is going to do a lot for us. We plan to build a new website um, and then activate some social media to help drive people to that website and hopefully uh, drive people to Royal Oak as well. So uh, thanks again for everything. I think this is really great. Congratulations, Mr. Lockwood. <clears throat> All right. This brings us to item number six, public comment. A few guidelines on public comment. The city commission values and relies on the input of our fellow citizens to help make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on any city-related issues, both on the agenda and not. I ask that comments be directed to the Commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. 
In addition to public comment, there will be a public hearing at tonight's meeting. If you're here to comment on the special assessment paving, you may wait until the public hearings are opened and you can comment at that time and the same rules that apply for public comment will apply during that public hearing. If you wish to speak tonight at either the public comment or the public hearing, please wait until recognized by me, the mayor. Then come up to the podium, state your name and address for the record. And uh, please be mindful that the city commission does want to hear from as many people as possible. So we do limit comments to three minutes and you have a timer at the podium to help you keep track of your time. If you don't wish to speak tonight, no worries. You're free to reach out to us at any time before or after city commission meetings. Uh, please note that the commission won't respond directly to questions during public comment. However, we are taking notes and will address the questions when the agenda topic is discussed or refer it to the proper city department if the matter isn't scheduled uh, to be discussed, discussed on the agenda tonight. So with that, who's first? Jason. Mayor and city commissioners, very nice to see you guys tonight. Um, my name is Jason Gittinger. I live at 2705 Clawson Avenue. I also own the Detroit School of Rock and Pop Music down the street and serve in a number of capacities through town. Um, I came tonight because I saw that we have OCC on the agenda later uh, for you guys to discuss. Um, and I wanted to lend some support their way, uh, specifically because I've had some, some great um, interaction with them over the last year, um, specifically last fall serving as the chair, uh, sorry, the president of the Chamber of Commerce Board, um, I was invited to a meeting to, to speak with uh, Chancellor Provenzano and uh, one of his lieutenants. Um, uh, speaking in terms of how to engage further with the city of Royal Oak, my first questions in that meeting were, where have you been for 20 years? Um, <laughs> um, I say that jokingly, but half serious, because for a while it seemed as if OCC disappeared. Um, in terms of connecting with our community. And um, it had been discussed at a lot of meetings over the years that I had been a part of. And I'm happy to report to you that over the last year, I've attended their trustee meetings at OCC. Um, I've gone to events where I've seen Mr. Provenzano himself serving and volunteering in their booths at Arts, Beats and Eats and other things. And I'm, um, I'm happy to see him personally taking charge of, of making sure that they're uh, organization is connected more with our city. Seeing um, in parts of those discussions last year, we had talked about the potential for them moving their culinary arts program and potentially arts programming to Royal Oak. And as the chair of the Commission for the Arts, I thought, wow, that would be fantastic for our neighborhood. Um, to take something like a community college that has, um, provides the, I should say, the easiest access for the community to engage with higher education, um, community college is generally that first step, and for um, them to make Royal Oaks focus, Royal Oaks focus, arts and culinary arts seems like a great fit for our community, and tremendous uptick for our neighborhood because um, we will give um, the people who need it their first foray into the world of the arts and culinary arts, um, um, a great home for that here in Royal Oaks. So I, I think it's a great a great thing for our community for them to. Um, to negotiate out on a piece of property down the street, and I think that would be a fantastic addition to our downtown. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to tell you. I don't know. I think it's a great thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Who else wishes to speak tonight at public comment? Oh, I saw a hand right here. Good evening, Victoria Schunk, 233 East Webster Road. The billboard above the Comedy Castle states, we support Royal Oak firefighters. For the welfare of our citizens, community, and firefighters, it's now time for the city government to join the ranks of these supporters. Um, the daily manpower must increase to 18 firefighters per day. The fire marshal is in great need for inspectors as well. The pension is underfunded at 49%, and the fire department is the only department that has not recovered from the loss of manpower in 2011. There is more than 19 million overage in the budget. There is over 300,000 in the ambulance revenues to get these positions filled. Let's get this job done and get those tra trucks back into service. 
Also, I would like to comment. It would behoove, and I respectfully request the city commission to remind the city manager of a station as an employee in a public service. It's slanderous and devices to our community to, to call any or infer any resident as a liar. Good evening. Hey, Michelle. Who's next? Yes, sir, in the front. Thank you. Stephen Miller, 115 Georgetown Square. Last week I attended the audit review committee meeting. I understand why no other residents attended. One, the material discussed is very dry and can be very boring. Two, Royal Oak residents and taxpayers are busy putting food on their family tables, paying their mortgages, saving for their retirements, and just living their lives. Besides, Royal Oak residents and taxpayers elect city officials who they hope they can trust to look out for the city, their property values, their family's best interests. As stated previously from this podium, I have nearly two decades of experience working on several municipal audits. I dare say again, that I have as much knowledge and understanding of the city's, the, the city's year-end CAFR or financial statements as anybody else in this room. What I observed at the Audit Review Committee meeting and with nearly a full review of these financial statements, in my humble opinion, is that there is a woeful lack of full transparency. While some of what I am about to outline is loosely covered in these financial statements, in my opinion, this mayor and this commission majority is not nearly transparent enough as to what they are doing with the taxpayers' money. These financial statements will not specifically point out the following. One, this commission majority, with malice in my opinion, specifically ignored every requirement of the city's most important general fund financial policy, a policy that has been clearly pointed out and adhered to every year since its inception in February 2006. Two, that this commission majority strong-armed and played bait-and-switch game with regards to the public safety millage by using millions of tax dollars raised to hire a little more than a dozen public safety employees and instead use this money to hire and fill nearly 50 administrative and other positions. Three, they have awarded nearly $18 million in no-bid contracts, which includes nearly $6 million this commission majority gave, gave, mind you, to a private developer with taxpayers retaining absolutely no equity interest. Somebody hit the lottery, with taxpayers' dollars, that is. These tax dollars are gone forever, never to be available for public safety, for city parks, just gone. Looking at these millions of dollars in no-bid contracts, this continued wasting of taxpayer money, I cannot help, I cannot stop wondering if many no-bid contracts were awarded to some of the campaign contributors to this commission majority. Four, this commission, this mayor and this commission majority have strapped the backs on the backs of the Royal Oak taxpayers, nearly a quarter of a billion dollars in debt that will have to be paid off by every taxpayer over the next several decades. The mayor and this commission majority will be long gone, having mismanaged millions of dollars that they will, and they will walk away with nary a care in the world, leaving us with a giant financial mess to clean up. Lastly, this mayor and commission majority recently tried to hoist onto the property hoist on more property taxes onto the backs of Royal Oak taxpayers with their totally ridiculous sidewalk and bus system millage proposals. Thank God the taxpayers saw through these malignant attempts to keep treating the taxpayers' wallets as the city's personal ATM machine. Really, more and more millage requests, more and more wasting of tax money. At long last, has this mayor and commission majority no shame when it comes to wasting taxpayers' hard-earned money? The question kind of answers itself, doesn't it? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Who's next? <clears throat> Let me just remind everyone, um, you know, some people may have an opposing opinion and clapping sort of sometimes I've got feedback makes them a little alienated and they may not want to come up and speak. So if you could hold your applause, we'd appreciate it. All right. Who's next? Yes, sir. In the back. Hello, Commission, Mayor, <laughs> neighbors. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending my meeting tonight. Sir, can we have your name and address? Uh, oh, uh, my name is Rick Vian. V is in Victor. I A N is in Nancy. I live at 418 East Third Street. I'm right downtown. I'm your neighbor here. Um, I'm afraid I've forgotten why I've asked you all here tonight. Just kidding. I have my notes. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little nervous. So I have an idea which I think is really good. 
it, it, I, it's an idea that I think is so good, other people are going to want to take credit for it. <laughs> uh, I talked to people at City Hall. I forgot the name of the people I talked to. <laughs> but they said that this idea was really good, and they said, bring it. Come to the City Commission meeting. Um, three years ago, oh, I've lived here for 23 years, by the way, at the corner down there. Three years ago, uh, before the parking lot um, was established and after the building was torn down at the corner of 3rd and Troy, <sighs> Some guy got permission from Royal Oak to make a skating rink. And he made a skating rink. He knows how to do it. I don't know who he was. The city brought lights there at night. Lots of people came and skated. I came and skated because it was half a block away. And it was very well attended. Now. If you go to New York City, Rockefeller Square, you go to Chicago, you go to t downtown Toronto, downtown Detroit, downtown Ottawa, everybody has skating. Now, um, the rinks are packed in all of these places. We were in Detroit the other day, and it was just packed down there. It brings, down, it brings people downtown to shop, to walk around, to eat. And you can't help but notice that there's a lot fewer people downtown Royal Oak in the winter than there is in the summer. So in that big, now, I, this is such a good idea. I know people shouldn't clap and cheer, but try and restrain your. Uh, that big round green lawn in the middle of the new park, which we're very excited about this whole building going on here, we're not against it. That big round green lawn, uh, you can put a skating rink there. It's good for the lawn. It's extremely cheap. Costs almost nothing to do that. I used to do it in my yard. We had a double lot, and the whole lot next door became a skating rink every winter, and I did it. You just need a hose. Uh, you can put in boards and plastic. You know, you could find this guy that did the other one. He could probably do it, but it costs almost nothing. You've got crowds of people down here. They're going to do other stuff downtown. What else are you going to use it for in the winter? You could have a fire pit. People gather around the fire pit. You could sell hot chocolate. You could have food trucks if you want. You could have ice fishing. Mr. Vian. Or not. We do love these ideas. I mean, truly, but I do have to ask you to uh, wrap it get up. your last thought. Yeah, in. Yeah. I want to be fair okay. to everybody. I'm so sorry. That's, that's pretty much it. You know, I just, my, <clears throat> my only other thought was that it should have a name, and you could call it the Rick Vian Skating Rink. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vian. And by the way, uh, I did love that ice rink there. I lost a pair of skates there. Did you? Yeah. My daughter thought it was pretty impressive when I went sliding across the ice. <laughs> yeah. All right. Who's next? I think I saw Mr. Wolf with the fast hand. Ron Wolf, 333 North, North Troy. Do you need any further proof that Lansing now controls Royal Oak via Ron Bolge, who just managed to flip a promised Class A taxable office structure? You wonder why Sir now left? Why? Because he flipped it to a nonprofit, non taxable outpatient clinic, much lower expense for him and more profit. The same commissioners approved for office that by the same job-hungry may, uh, mayor who invited Mr. Bolge, who, insists on, who, sits, who Mr. Bolge sits on numerous Lansing boards, a is a political fundraising developer who receives lucrative no-bid contracts and millions in subsidies, coincidentally. All 
assisted enthusiastically by our charter illegal non-resident city manager who works for who? Who is exactly the question? Evidenced by outrageous un unwanted sidewalk assessments to prepare the city for unwanted bus system, you wisely voted down. Evidenced by Mr. Johnson's rescinding of tacit permission for seniors, low-income elderly, at the Royal Oak Manor to continue to use their too far to walk for permits uh, at Lot 7 for, at, at their capriciously and recently installed meters around their building just in time for the frigid weather. Not our problem. They lost their parking to construction, he says. Seniors deserve no special treatment, he says. All this approved by admiring commission stooges. All the while, these same commissioners hypocritically enjoy free parking anywhere in our city as a perk for being a city commissioner. What else can one say? The proverbial ball of crap rolls downhill onto the backs of vulnerable residents who have no say other than three minutes while valuable property is contracted to commission favorite contractors, such as with the new octopus of a new city hall taking up half the parking of the farmer's market, thus sealing his fate as a market to buy from Michigan farmers. A farmer's market, though its building will be designated historic, will be as useful as to farmers as our Indian trail is useful to Native Americans. Special deals for special people, valuable downtown property sold for a lousy dollar, millions illegally loaned from the General Fund for Private Development, millions more of your tax dollars approved by the shills you elected, rolling uphill into non-residents' special interest pockets for the benefit of you. If you believe it is for your benefit, I have this bridge in Brooklyn for sale. For just one recent example of waste, 75000 for a farmer's market public relations regarding parking just approved. Money that could have been used to help the handicapped residents of Royal Oak Manor with their lost parking, or low-income seniors with their unwanted sidewalk assessments. $3,000 water bills. All this in the season of giving. Um, it amazes me how many residents robotically stand during invocations by hypocritical commissioners who choose to uh, attack those that uh, dissent at some time, at some times at the, and, and again, and it, I believe that if the Royal Acorns who run this city really wanted to help the farmer's market at this point, without spending an additional dime of taxpayers' money, and at the same time triple the foot traffic, all they would have to do is say, Free Friday, Sunday, weekend parking downtown in Royal Oak during construction. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. No. Their ears Mr. are Wolf, only I open to the to clink of political thought, coin. No, thank you for doing nothing, Mr. Fournier, and for just favoring the developers and those that come here to rape our city and take Mr. as Wolf. much money as they can. Mr. Wolf, thank you. $10,000 donation. Come on, give me a break. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Who's next? Going once, going twice. Oh, Mr. Colo. Uh, Brandon Colo, 600 East Hudson Avenue. Um, so I'm here tonight as a library board member, and the rest of my friends have all left me to make a couple announcements. Um, first of all, we'd like to again thank you, Mr. Boji. Uh, $10,000 is about 1,000 books. Um, there's a lot we can do with that money. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. We're excited to open up that north entrance again. Um, we have a lot of patrons from Bar and Towers that walk over, and you can imagine what a hassle that is to walk around, um, especially with uh, parking lots closed right now. You have to walk a considerable distance. So we look forward to having that entrance open again, uh, finally, after 12 or 13 years. Um, on top of that, uh, the director here would like me to announce that we uh, are replacing her tomorrow night. So I encourage all our residents to come out. Um, our meeting starts at 6.30 tomorrow night. We've had many highly qualified candidates, uh, and it's been a, uh, a real pleasure trying to select the next leader of our library. Uh, so tomorrow night, the board will get together to deliberate and hopefully make our final decision on uh, who somehow, and only God knows how, can replace Mary's footsteps. Um, in addition to that, uh, teaming up with the Commission of the Arts, 
you'll see the sharing the warmth back at the library again this year for its second incarnation. Um, I'm still finishing my scarf from last year, so <laughs> I've, uh, I, it's, it's about that long now, so I'm feeling pretty excited. Um, so we've had a lot of volunteers uh, put out some great scarves. If you know anyone that's cold, anyone that needs them, they're, they're there, they're waiting, they're looking for new homes. They're looking for someone who's cold walking by who uh, needs to uh, warm up a little. Um, volunteers knit them and place them, and they're maintained all winter, so we're excited to have that back again. So with that, uh, unless there's any questions, that's all I have. Questions for Mr. Cullo? In his capacity as a library board member, not in his capacity as knitting? <laughs> All right. If you miss the second stitch, it's a pain to get back to. That's what I found. Oh my Keep working on that. I, it's one day. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Colo. Yep. Thank you, sir. Mary Karshner, I got to tell you, the library board from time to time is faced with impossible tasks. And, you know, most of the time with your leadership, they can overcome those tasks and accomplish about what they need to accomplish. But I think in this particular case, it is going to be impossible to replace you. You've done an amazing job, and uh, we're so blessed and lucky. Our children are so blessed and lucky to have you over the years serving us uh, with great distinction and honor uh, in the library. And I'm going to get up. I'm going to give you a hug. I'm going to try not to cry. But they're, they're choosing my successor, and it, it has been a true privilege to be part of the library. Well, we've heard rumblings. We know they're working on it, but the news tonight that it's good news for you. <laughs> and it's going to be good news for the library. It will be. And the city. It will be. Just make sure Brandon only gets a half a vote at that meeting. <laughs> I, I have been blessed you, with sir. very good library boards over my time as director, too, and that, that's made it a whole lot more wonderful. Well, we wish you luck in the search, and uh, I know we have a few months left, Mary, but we'll have to f squeeze in some extra visits uh, to the library. Yes, sir. I'm Bob Shepard. I'm a 66-year resident of Royal Oak. And uh, back in 2009, I purchased some property uh, at the corner of Crooks and Windermere. And uh, I approached the city because I wanted to build a building there. And the uh, planning department said, well, why don't you look at building even a little bit larger building? And we'll work with you to accommodate additional parking that you might need. I then stepped up and said to the city commission and to the planning department, if you'll work with me to help build this medical building on the corner of Crooks and Windermere, I'll build the building at my cost. I'll maintain the parking lot at my cost. It will be a city parking lot that can be used for parks and recreation on weekends and nights and special events. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get the building out of the ground. 2009 was a bad time for building and construction. Um, but I have never deviated from the desire to build that building and want to build that. On Saturday of this week, um, the city came to me prior to that, and, and we issued a licensing agreement between us. The city agreed to let me use the land if I built it at my cost, over $100,000, if I would donate the, the property to the city, not the property, but the rights to use the parking lot for parks and recreation. 66-year resident, five children through the city, and I agreed to do that at my expense with zero expense to the city, fully insuring it for the city so they had no liability. Um, from that point, um, the license agreement was put into place, and Dave and I worked on that. And I talked to Dave today, and I don't know if this is off the agenda, Dave, but I wanted to make sure that I made my voice heard on it. Um, basically, on Saturday, I got a letter saying that the city has authorized the termination of the lease agreement. I haven't broken any covenants in the lease agreement. I haven't changed any of the lease agreement. I haven't built the building yet, but I don't think it's fair that I'm notified on Saturday that the city and the city council is going to pull my licensing agreement, my lease agreement on the property from me without any prior notification. So I don't know where we're at on it, Dave, but 
and I know I'm not supposed to address you individually, but I just don't think it's fair. If the city needs it back for something, okay, if you just talk to me, I'm the guy that said, I'll build you a parking lot for free. You just had people here are irate because you're supposedly giving away things to developers. I'm offering to give the city a $100,000 plus parking lot. And I didn't even get the courtesy of a phone call from planning, from the city commission, from the mayor, nothing. So I just said, it's over, you're gone. And I just don't think it's fair. And that's it. Thank you. Who's next? Who got paid off? Who's next? Who is next? No one? Going once, going twice. All right, we're going to bring the meeting back up to this side of the table. All right, this gets us to item number seven, which is approval of the agenda. Commissioner Douglas. Move approval of the agenda. We have a motion by Commissioner Douglas, second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion on the agenda? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The agenda is approved. Uh, item number eight is a consent agenda. Based on the last public comment, I'll ask that item D be pulled off for discussion. Is there anything else? Anybody else wishes to pull off the consent agenda at this time? Okay. So the consent agenda will now consist of City Commission meeting minutes from November 26, December 1, 2018, claims from December 4th and December 7th of 2018, approval of purchase orders, we've pulled off item D to discuss, uh, E, contract modification to contract cap 1715 asphalt resurfacing improvements, and to receive and file the non-action items for the June 30th, 2018 retiree health care actuarial evaluation report. October 2018, Southeastern Oakland County Resource Recovery Authority Quarterly Report. October 2018, Southeastern Oakland County Water Authority Quarterly Report. And the November 2018 Investment Report. Is there a motion? Motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there support? Supported by Commissioner Macy. Discussion on the consent agenda. All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. This brings us to item... Letter D, authorization to terminate license agreement, Warden Park. I guess we have a gentleman that made a public comment here about some of the timing with his notification. Um, maybe Mr. Gillum, he did reference you, so you can maybe. Mayor Forney and City Commissioners, uh, Mr. Shepard and I did talk today. In fact, and I remember Mr. Shepard from when we uh, executed this license agreement back in uh, 2009. Um, this is a, an issue that was brought forward by the planning department. Um, as I understand, they're contemplating uh, the use of some CBDG funding for some improvements on the area of Warden Park that is covered by the license agreement that uh, Mr. Shepard's entity has. Um, the sh planning department, as I understand, based upon records in BSNA in the, in the building system, was under the impression that Mr. Shepard did not intend to go forward with his own development, his, his adjacent development. Um, that's what prompted the uh, building department, I'm sorry, the planning department to bring this item forward for the commission's agenda tonight. Um, Mr. Shepard, as I understand, just received notification that the action was going to be on the agenda tonight. What he indicated to me that he, in fact, does still intend to go forward with the construction of a medical office building and the construction of the parking lot that would be shared by the city for purposes of Warden Park and the uh, tenants and visitors to his medical office building. Um, he had asked today that the matter be pulled off the agenda um, so he would have a chance to talk directly with the staff and community development and if need be, if the recommendation was still gonna be coming forward to the commission table to prepare a formal uh, response that the, he could share with the city commission at that later date. Okay, so really, I mean, we're at a position right now where planning was under a presumption. That presumption was incorrect. Um, and both parties want to discuss at our planning department. Mr. Shepard want to see what the future plans are uh, for at least his interest in it. And is there any concern or cause for concern if we push this out to another commission meeting? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I can't speak for the uh, the community development department staff, but again, I think they were just they're exploring options for the 
this piece of Warden Park property, and this was a loose end hanging out there as far as they were concerned. Okay. So. Commissioner Pruch? It says in the memo from staff that um, the licensee has never provided with this, the city with the insurance that apparently was a provision in the license agreement and has failed to implement additional terms and conditions of the license agreement. The license agreement itself wasn't attached to this memorandum. So if this is going to get pushed to another meeting, like maybe next Monday, to give you all an opportunity to discuss, I would like to see a copy mm -hmm. of that license agreement and also have them explain in a little bit more detail the issue about the insurance that was required under the terms of that license agreement and the other terms and conditions that the staff feels that the licensee uh, did not comply with um, so that we just have some better background information here. Um, I, I, I Mr. Shepard, we the meeting's up here. Well, well just a second. Let Commissioner Perush finish. Um, that's essentially it. I, I, I would like to see the license agreement specifically, but I'm also concerned about um, the allegation that the insurance uh, wasn't paid as required by the terms of the license agreement. I would just like a little bit more information about that. <clears throat> Mayor, Commissioners, I could respond to some of those issues, but again, if we're bringing it back for potential discussion at a later date, I think it would be appropriate to gather the background information. Yeah. And we can answer any and all questions at that time. Sure. So. That'd be fine. Commissioner Levasseur. Uh, Mr. Gilman, as far as timing goes, when do you think would be an appropriate time for us to revisit this? Well, um, we do have a quick turnaround with the agenda for next week's meeting. Um, I'm not aware of any reason that this would have to be next week. If the commission actually wants to have the discussion next week, we can. From my perspective, I don't see any reason why it couldn't take place after the first of the year. That would also give Mr. Shepard ample opportunity to meet with the staff and community development. Um, but again, it's the commission's choice. So, Does anyone feel any sense of urgency? Doesn't sound like we have any. Commissioner Pruch? Mr. Gillum, you mentioned that planning or community development was talking about using some block grant funds for this particular area. Was that, was that, did I understand that correctly? That's the information that I received from Mr. Murphy, yes. Okay. D they're not into like bid acquisitions and all that. I mean, they're not planning a parking lot starting like in April or something. They're, they're just thinking about it at this point in time? I think they're exploring options and potential projects using CBDG funding. Okay, but there's nothing, there's no shovels in the ground, you know, this spring or anything like that. Not that I'm aware of, no. Oh, okay. And, no. and this situation wouldn't prevent or hinder our ability to move forward with any community block grant funding, at least at this time. It's just a matter of a housekeeping item to shore up and understand who has, you know, rights to the Warden Park property and go through that process, correct, as part of the application, I assume? And that's my understanding, yes. Okay. Okay, all right. Thanks. M Mr. Shepard, I think. About to begin. You haven't even granted anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can I just close the one two second statement, okay? I will allow Mr. Unless anyone strongly object, objects, I'll mm -hmm. let Mr. Shepard come up here for one minute. And, yeah. Okay. Come on, Mr. Shepard. Um, your comment about um, no insurance on the property and not fulfilling an obligation. I have no obligation to insure the property until the parking lot is built. Okay. And it's very clear what I have to provide the city. I have provided the city everything they have asked for, okay? And the only time I need to implement the insurance is once I build the parking lot, after I pro provide a performance bond and it's built to the city specs. And I do not have to, at this point, provide insurance on a parking lot that does not exist, okay? And the fact that I have not complied with any other items on the agenda or on the licensing agreement, there is nothing else that the city has asked me to provide. Okay, uh, I have not uh, negated anything on that, and I think Dave will show you in the licensing agreement that that's the case. Okay. 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 Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Commissioner Levasseur. If I may address a question to Mr. Shepard, I just want to determine if, if there, he has any conflicts with either January. 14th or January 28th, those would be the two dates in January that we might revisit this. No, none whatsoever. I live in Royal Oak. I'm five minutes from City Hall. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So anyone want to make a motion to push? Mr. Gillum? Just, I just want to make one brief comment. And again, we'll talk more about this in January, it sounds like. But I think part of the reason that 
the planning uh, department took the action that it did is because Mr. Shepard did at one point have actual site plan approval for the office building, but the site plan approval has been long expired. Mm -hmm. So the planning department didn't see any progress being made over at the site. So I think that's part of what motivated us. It sounds like it's maybe more of a lack of communication than anything else. Yeah, but sounds like it. Commissioner Douglas? Uh, yeah, I'll move to postpone this, and I'm going to suggest we do it at that second meeting in January because um, with the, the time we have between our next week's meeting and the one after, a bunch of stuff is going to wind up on the agenda. So that would be the, is that the 28th? 28th. Yeah. Okay. Have a motion by Commissioner Douglas, support by Commissioner Perush. Discussion? Well, sad, Mr. Shepard, thank you for your patience. Thank you for coming out tonight. And uh, we'll see if, I think this vote's going to go in favor. So we'll see you on the 28th. Thank you. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, this brings us to item number nine, which is the acceptance of the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2018 financial audit report and comprehensive annual financial report. I see Mr. Balderman's here. <coughs> I think he's not in the best lighting. There he is. All right. How you doing, Nate? Good. How are you? Good. Oh, well, you want me to, you want to kick it off, Ms. Rudd? Sure. All right. Good evening, good evening uh, Mayor and City Commissioners. Um, this is a request for the City Commission to accept the uh, financial or financial audit report and the annual comprehensive annual financial report. Um, about two weeks ago, the uh, audit review committee met with um, the audit principal, uh, Mr. Balderman, um, myself, City Manager, the Assistant Finance Director. We met for not quite two hours. Um, going over the uh, two reports, um, and um, this is simply asking the city commission to um, accept uh, their recommendation to accept this this report. Um, as you'll hear from Mr. Balderman, um, they issued an unmodified report, which is a, doesn't sound special, but it is a um, a, a good result. And the only thing um, I wanted to point out, um, there may be some concern. Um, on page uh, 46 and page 123, um, the Water and Sewer Fund and the Recreation uh, Fund ha both had deficit positions and uh, unrestricted net assets again this year, but that is because of the, re uh, the new uh, GASB standards we early implemented last year, and of course we continue that on this year, um, for um, uh, OPEB liability and um, also the um, the issuance of the debt for the OPEB as well um, got recorded uh, early, implement, early implemented last year. And um, I just want to uh, make a note that those funds have a total net position of um, the water and sewer uh, of $74 million and the uh, recreation of $2.3 million. Um, so that provides positive working capital reserve at year end. So um, this is... Um, something that the State Treasury Department considers as an exception to the deficit elimination plan. Therefore, uh, we will not need to file a deficit elimination plan with the State Treasury Department. So. Any questions for Ms. Rudd before we allow Mr. Balderman to speak? Thank you, Ms. Thank Rudd. you. Mr. Ballard. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Um, uh, as she stated, we did uh, meet, uh, it was a short meeting this year, um, just under two hours, uh, with the Audit Review Committee, uh, did go over uh, the financial statements in a lot of detail, um, as well as the results of our audit. Um, as she stated, it's an unmodified opi opinion um, on the financial statements, which basically means that the information uh, is uh, fairly stated in all material respects, um, and that you can rely on the information. Um, Again, there's a level of materiality when we're looking at things, so it's not a, you know, these are perfect financial statements. Um, but they are uh, something that you can rely on. Also, um, <coughs> in that, as a part of that report, we, uh, we um, audit under government auditing standards, and as a part of that, um, we're required 
uh, to issue a separate report on internal controls. We don't give an actual opinion on internal controls, but we do uh, provide, um, are required to provide any, um, a report on any issues that come to our attention that are material or significant in nature. Um, pleased to, to state that there were no such findings this year. Um, that report is actually in the back of the report this year uh, instead of in a separate report as it has been in the past as a single audit. Um, this year with your drop in community development block grant um, spending, um, you drop below the threshold uh, for a single audit. So a single audit wasn't required this year. Um, and, and so it's not included. So um, other than that, I really don't have anything specific that I wanted to, to share. But if, the, if there's any questions that you have, I'd be happy to answer now. Um, but also would be happy if there's things as you look through the financial statements, through, look through our reports. If you uh, have any questions, feel free to work through uh, Julie or Tony to, to get me questions, and I'd be happy to respond. Any questions right now at this point? Commissioner Perush. The memo that Julie gave us indicated that um, in terms of the numbers that you're talking about for the two funds, the water fund and the, the recreation fund and the deficit position, it wasn't enough to trigger the deficit elimination plan requirements that the state treasury requires. Are you finding that there are a number of communities that are finding themselves in that position because of the change in the, in the reporting requirements by the state treasury? That kind of hit us, not blindsided, but it was kind of came out of the blue, so to speak. So are you finding other communities that are struggling with that aspect of their financial reporting? Um, yeah, definitely. With, with the implementation of the new standards where basically you're putting the unfunded liability um, on your books where you didn't have to have that in the past, it has taken a lot of communities where they had positive balances and taken them into, ne into negative balances. Uh, it's particular... Um, becomes an issue for enterprise fund reporting because that's full accrual accounting. So it happens in government-wide financial statements quite a bit, um, but that doesn't affect the general fund, so it doesn't hit that side. But when you start hitting those liabilities into your enterprise funds, that's causing uh, a lot of deficits um, in the unrestricted. Um, but that's, that's actually why the state came out with the other guidance. I mean, the guidance that came that, w that required um, – reporting that those liabilities wasn't from Treasury. It was actually from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, mm -hmm. um, which you're required to follow those standards. And so then Treasury put this, um, uh, it was a part of what they put out and what they were considering when, when they were looking at these deficit elimination plans to say, we're really looking to see, you know, is there a working capital uh, is there working capital in, in these funds? And if they are, if there is, then they're not requiring any kind of deficit elimination plan. So it's it's a complicated, uh, they've made it comp more complicated than it needs to be, but it's a complicated um, calculation that they go through, but it basically comes down to you have working capital or not, and you do, so you don't have to file that. Because it's enterprise funds, which are supported by f fees and, and that to come in, like for example, in the water sewer fund, you know, we all pay our water bill and that's where the revenue comes from for that fund. Is this going to indicate to us that uh, perhaps on a next year going forward basis, we're going to have to adjust those fees in order to eliminate this possibility in future years or recreational fees? Or is, is this something that accounting wise, it can be accounted for some other way? Uh, it can be accounted for in other ways. I mean, it's really something that, um, and Julie can, can answer more to this, but, you know, it's, it's really a reporting change. Um, how you're funding it really hasn't changed. You have, you still have an actual evaluation that says, you know, this is how we're going to fund these. And in your case, in certain liabilities, you've actually bonded for it and and set how you're going to make those payments into the future. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's really the funding basis that you have um, already established. So it really shouldn't have a huge impact on on what the rates are from what it would have been in the past. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we do the water and sewer rates more on a cash flow basis. Okay. Yeah, so you won't see a, a large impact because of that. Okay. Yeah, the impact will be on our cash needs. So, um, no, this will not, you will not see that reflected in the rates. This, this is actually our second year as well. Oh, okay. Um, we early implemented OPEB, uh, or the GASB uh, 74, 75 last year. Um, so we had a def, uh, an unrestricted uh, 
net asset deficit as well last year. In these two funds? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it for me. Any other questions? Any motions? Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of the resolution to accept these reports. Motion by Commissioner Perush. Is there support? Support by Commissioner Duba. Discussion? No discussion? All right. Well, before I call the vote, I'll just thank Ms. Rudd once again and the team. They do an amazing job. We appreciate Riemann coming out and, you know, checking our books for us, giving us an independent opinion. Uh, and, uh, of course, we're happy with the news, but that has nothing to do with you guys, but everything to do with Ms. Rudd and her department and the rest of the city here. Uh, but nonetheless, we appreciate your hard work. So with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number 10 is read again, acceptance of the June 30th, 2018 Retirement Pension Actuarial Valuation Report. Yes, another interesting report. Um, this was presented uh, to the Retirement Board on December 3rd by the actuary. Um, I'll just go over, um, I've got some bulleted points there in my commission letter, but um, I'll just go over briefly some of the more uh, significant uh, items in the report. I do mention in the, in the letter, I would encourage the City Commission to read the entire report. There is a lot of um, information, good information in the report. Um, the purpose of the valuation is to gauge the retirement systems funding progress and to let us know how much we need to put in for contributions um, for the next budget year, which is July 1, 2019. Um, the report um, reports that the um, unfunded accrued liability is um, seven point, I'm just going to use round number, $7.7 .7 million. That's $2.1 million over last year's report. Uh, we do this report for pension annually. Um, $6.7 million is related to uh, the police and fire group. The balance is the general employees. Um, the entire system, when you combine the general employees and the police and fire, um, is approximately 65% funded as of June 30th, 2018, which is uh, the uh, measurement date for this report. Um, about 93.5% funded for general employees and about 49.5% funded for police and fire. So that's where the 64.9% comes in, the combination of those two. Um, and uh, the only other thing I'll go over in the letter here is the, uh, the new unfunded accrued liability is uh, $84.7 million. So the res resolution in the packet is um, asking the commission to accept the report to certify that the city's uh, contribution for fiscal year July 1, 2019 will be at a minimum of $7,744,404. Questions for Ms. Rudd? Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, the 84.7, now that's, I, I believe that that's different from what we saw previously, which I believe was right around 50 million. Is, is that due to the, the different assumptions, or is there something else involved? Yeah, uh, I wrote on one of the bullets, um, the biggest difference is due to the new assumptions, which I believe are on page um, A10, the retirement board um, um, actually undertook an experience study this year, and they accepted the recommendations from the actuary based on that experience study. Uh, one of the more significant changes is changing the investment rate of return from 7.75% uh, to 7.25%. And I want to make sure I'm understanding the 84.7 is specifically public safety that we're looking at here. That's all of, all. Okay. That's uh, general employees as well. All right, okay. Uh, 
Earlier in the memo, memo we, we indicate that the uh, annual required contribution is calculated at 61.21% payroll. Is that including this ARC in that total sum, or, or is that? Correct. That's normal cost and the unfunded. Mm -hmm. And that's for uh, police and fire, and that's an open plan, so that's all of police and fire payroll, and then that 20% of payroll for general employees, um, that's for members only. So new hires um, that are in the DC plan, um, that does not include their payroll on the general employees. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I totally picked that up, but... Uh, okay, I can, I can try again yeah. here. Um, the 61% of payroll for police and fire... Um, everyone that is um, a member of the police and fire department are members of the pension system because they have an open plan. So that is pretty much 61% of payroll. That's what we apply to collect our ARC. Okay, and, and that's for current benefits as well as catching up on... on yes, previous. both normal costs right. and unfunded liability. So, so 61 cents on the dollar goes toward that. Yes, you right. can say it that way. And then for the um, general employees, I have here is 20%. That's 20% of uh, the members in the plan. So we have a lot of general employees who are not members. So it's not all of payroll for general employees. It's just 20% uh, of the, um, the, the staff that are in the uh, defined benefit plan. <clears throat> <clears throat> Commissioner Dubuck. So yeah, uh, Commissioner Gibbs and I serve on the uh, you know, retirement pension boards, and uh, you know this has been something that's been a discussion for months. I know we talked about you know we were uh, kind of circling around this uh, last budget cycle when we were talking about whether or not we need to increase our contribution um, uh, for uh, pension and health care. And so what we found through these discussions is. Uh, our our staff's uh, projections at 7.75 return average over over years, <clears throat> largely due to new state regs, um, had to be lowered. So we lowered our expectation of the 7.25, which is as as Ms. Rudd said, the lion's share of the new increase. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. So you know, we dug into that a bit and and landed on the 7.25 um, with I, I think a, a level of confidence that that's going to get right. us where we even think we went more conservative than necessary because of the demands of the new state laws and that will probably outperform that um, over the length of of the fund. Um, so folks were folks felt pretty good about the 7.25. I mean, obviously it's a new uh, it's an increase uh, in cash to the city is a good thing that we have a fund balance to give us a little bit of runway. Um, as as those the, that expenditure is going to increase over the next few years, um, but I think at the end of the day we were pretty satisfied with where we landed, and more comfortable with the seven point two five. And if if I could just add, both um, financial advisors, um, um, there's two separate boards, but uh, the trustees are the same on the board. So there's a financial advisor for each board. Um, they are both advising the next 10 years that, you know, w we are not going to see the 7.75, you know, um, <clears throat> right. is a recommendation. They're more in the six, maybe six and a half percent right. in the next 10 years. So that was a big factor as well. Because they were looking at the historical data saying over 30 years we would definitely get that. Correct. And so mm -hmm. in the near term, mm -hmm. we would have been falling short. So, um, does this need to be accepted? I'll move to accept the, the uh, auditors of the report. Okay, motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a support? Support by Commissioner Gibbs. All right, discussion? I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Rudd. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate all the hard effort. Thank you. Quality work, once again. Okay, this brings us to item number 11, the public hearing of necessity and standard resolutions three and four for the special assessment paving of Masoit Avenue, or Road. Um, Mr. Callahan. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. <clears throat> uh, the city received a petition to pave Masoit Road with 75% of the accessible frontage property signatures in favor of that. Uh, we've passed standard resolution one already and standard resolution two. Uh, which set the date of a public hearing of necessity to take place this evening. Um, 
the commission should open and hold the public hearing of necessity and afterwards closing it. Uh, they can act on standard resolutions three and four. Standard resolution three and four deems the project a necessity and standard resolution four sets the date for a public hearing of assessment. Questions for Mr. Callahan. Mr. Lavasser. Is this a, a one block section of, of the road? Yes, it is. All right. And the four parcels, are they all same frontage? Same, same bill. Uh, I know that information is back here, and I can it look it up real quick. The same based on the uh, mm -hmm. how they were charging. Yeah, I think six, so. yeah. six and thirty-six. Yep. Thank you. I'm going to see. Yes, even though I haven't gotten there yet. I have. Yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right. Well, I'm going to open up the public hearing. Same rules apply as to public comment. If you're here to speak on this tonight, uh, please raise your hand. Come on up, sir. You're first. Good evening. My name is Nicholas Cadel, K-A-D-E-L. I live at 4258 Hampton Boulevard. Uh, I'm a new resident to Royal Oak. My husband and I moved from Ypsilanti Township back in June. Uh, we were fortunate enough to find uh, a new home under construction, fell in love with it, fell in love even more so with the neighborhood. Uh, that's really what sold us on moving to Royal Oak. Uh, the, frankly, the accessibility, the community, um, even the bike lanes, uh, we love it all. Um, this is a fantastic city, and we're really proud to be residents. Um, we were a little concerned at the time when we found out that our new property was adjacent to a dirt road. Uh, mm -hmm. Living in the township, that's what we saw a lot. We saw a lot of dirt roads, and we didn't really expect that in Royal Oak. Um, we fell in love with the city so much that we decided to give it a chance. Um, our our, our commitment was really solidified when I actually called the city engineer's office, spoke with the city engineer, who I really appreciate him taking 15, 20 minutes of his time on a Friday afternoon to share with me the process to get the uh, road paved. Shortly after moving in, we met with our neighbors. Um, each one of the neighbors that actually has a driveway that lands onto the dirt road on Masoit uh, agreed to sign the petition. The fourth uh, neighbor, um, wasn't opposed, uh, based on our conversations, to actually joining us. Was a little concerned about sharing the full brunt of the cost and was under the assumptions that some other opportunities would be available. Um, the rest of the neighbors decided to go ahead with the petition, and here we are. So we appreciate your support. We actually appreciate the opportunity to partner with the city in improving our neighborhood even more um, and look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cato. Appreciate Excellent. you coming out and sticking it out tonight. Thank you. Anybody else here to speak at uh, tonight's public hearing? All righty, I'm going to close the public hearing. Bring the meeting back up here. Commissioner Lavasser? Uh, just some follow-up questions. Is it just that one block section that's dirt, or is there a larger section that's also dirt in this there are, area? There are more than one block in that neighborhood of Masoit that um, are unimproved. Uh, however, there's uh, each block has to petition on their own. So this block came forward and asked for that. Uh, we, we, as part of our road millage program, did send out letters to every property that fronts on a dirt roadway and uh, made them aware that we have an incentive program going on. And uh, uh, we're still hearing a few streets trickle in like this, but uh, we think we've got most of the people that wanted to have it done done already if if there were say two blocks instead of one that had petitioned to be paved would, would that impact the, uh, the the cost per per household uh, in in a significant manner or would it still be the approximately I, I don't see it right in front of me sixty five hundred dollars per household um, Without having gone out to bid the project, because that can affect the final costs. Right now, this is the best estimate we have for what a street that size would cost to be paved. Yeah, I, what I'm trying to get a sense of is, is whether there would be a significant decrease in cost if, say, we were doing two blocks instead of just one, where the, the, the cost per household might be, say, 4000 instead of 6000 Something like that. Nothing to get a not, not a significant drop of that. All right. Any other questions? Any motions? Commissioner Douglas. Uh, do we need to do a roll call vote on this? I believe we have to do a roll call vote on this, yeah. On, and on vote, we have to do the two resolutions separately. 
Okay. I would recommend. Yeah, I think for clarity, because okay. that'll be hard if in case you have a mixed vote on the <laughs> resolutions. Um, okay, I will move approval of special assessment standard resolution three. Motion by Commissioner Douglas is there support. Support by Commissioner Dubuck. We'll start with Commissioner Douglas. Aye. Commissioner Aye. Macy. Commissioner Lasser. Aye. Commissioner Gibbs. Aye. Commissioner Pruch. Yes. Commissioner Dubuck. Aye. And I vote yes. Okay, the motion passes. Commissioner Douglas. I'll move approval of special assessment standard resolution number four. Okay. Support by Commissioner Macy. Commissioner Douglas. Aye. Commissioner Macy. Aye. Commissioner Lavassor. Aye. Commissioner Aye. Gibbs. Commissioner Pruch. Yes. Commissioner Dubuck. Aye. And I vote yes. Okay, both motions pass and so we'll be back again for the assessments. Uh, after the first of the year. After the first of the year. One more question for uh, Mr. Commissioner Callen. Dubuck. Mr. Callen, just to uh, remind folks, uh, this uh, incentive program is running for the duration of the road millage. Is that accurate? It is, but at some point we're going to have to call it closed. Um, we're entering the fifth year of a 10-year program coming up. Okay. And with some of the bonding that we did at the very start of the program to uh, upfront some of the bigger, more costly projects, we want to be able to stretch our dollars as far as we can. And, and you know, I would probably be recommending uh, around year seven that we probably close this but okay so for the near term we're still or you know the city as a whole we're all picking up a larger share of these projects than we had in the past yes right. 50 so, percent more than what we had in the past right. to the extent that there's going to be a deadline i think we just want to communicate that it would be really unfortunate if someone rallies their street and finds out that they just came in six months after we stopped doing this because it's a pretty substantial savings to yeah. the property owners it is all right thanks Mr. Pruce. Just to put some numbers on it, for those of you who are listening out there, the total cost of the project for this, this one block, the est estimate is a hundred. Let me read this right: one hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars to pave this one block of pavement. Of that amount, the residents who are fronting this, the four residents, are only going to be paying together cumulatively about twenty-six thousand dollars. So they're paying approximately a quarter of the total cost of the paving of this road. The city is picking up the rest. The road bond millage um, is picking up the rest of this. So that's a, that's a significant savings. So if you're sitting there on your unpaved road and you're doing the numbers in your head, that's how it comes down, at least at least in terms of this street. These residents are getting a, a fully paved street um, for a quarter of the cost of what it would cost um, normally. So that, that's a huge savings. Significant. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, in less dramatic fashion, we move forward with uh, the next step in the paving of Masoit. So thank you. Spread the word. All right. This brings us to item number 12, the headline event tonight. I see Chancellor Provenzano here coming up. Um, I don't know how we're going to kick it off, but maybe uh, Chancellor, welcome. Thank you for your patience tonight. Thank you. And we're very excited about uh, what you're going to present. So We are, too. And so uh, my name is Peter Provenzano, Chancellor at Oakland Community College. Good evening. Thank you for having us here today. Um, we are really very excited to offer you just a glimpse of what we have in mind for our Royal Campus. And uh, as many of you may know, our art programs are predominantly located, uh, particularly culinary as well as theater and music at our Orchard Ridge campus, which is in Farmington Hills. And for those of you who are familiar with that campus, it is a beautiful, sprawling campus, ideal for learning, especially if you're looking for that traditional college experience, but very difficult to provide accessibility to our programs, particularly the Culinary Institute, because of parking, and it's a long walk. And so we've been analyzing all of our, our campuses, taking a look not only at the renovations that need to be done, but also the programs that are located at each campus. And we had this idea, and we said, well, in order to make the culinary and all of the arts more accessible, what if we brought it down to the Royal Oak campus? Because of its location being an urban campus, it is so much more accessible and open to the public, which is really our goal. We really want the arts to be uh, accessible to the community. And so we decided, you know, let's take our idea and reach out to the Royal Oak community itself. And it was very important to us for us to obtain uh, the input from the community because as uh, uh, Jason uh, Gettinger said, we do want to be a much greater partner uh, in Royal Oak 
and with the community than we have in the past. And uh, by the way, that's already just begun. This first year was the first year that we were a major sponsor of Arts, Beats, and Eats, which was a great opportunity for us to showcase our art programs. We've um, partnered with the uh, Chamber uh, and their flower sale. We've uh, allowed them to use our surface lots. We allow uh, the zoo to use our parking garages as a, as a backup location on busy days. Um, we're talking to city administration about opening up our parking garages on the weekends and kind of discussing the feasibility and the demand for that. And we've even most recently talked to the city administration about co-branding some billboards, not billboards, some, I uh, don't say that word, uh, some uh, <laughs> signs on our, our lampposts. And we gave you an example of what that could look like. And so it's really quite very exciting, the partnerships that are already underway. And so we reached out to the city administration first and then the Chamber of Commerce as well as the Restaurant Association to get their input and, and said, you know, what do you think of this idea? And the feedback that we received was just tremendously positive. And so the next step was to reach out to our architect and say, is this feasible? Can we build what we're looking to build on the property that we own in Royal Oak? And our architect came back and said, yes, you can. If you have the ability to utilize the uh, parcel of property that's owned by the city uh, directly uh, next to our, our property. And so we uh, asked our architect to uh, come up with some architectural renderings to give the city and the public an idea of what we have in mind. I mean, these, and there'll be some disclaimers, I'm sure that uh, John will say along the way in his presentation, as you can imagine, these are just ideas to give you a flavor of what we have in mind. Um, we would have to go through a, a much deeper process and uh, cross-section of people to give us um, some greater depth on how to design this. But um, we wanted to take the opportunity tonight to give you an idea and an update on what we have in mind. We also have a number of um, administrators from OCC as well as several of our, our board of trustees that are here to answer any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, John. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been sitting for a while there. Um, my name is John Miller from uh, TMP uh, Architectural Firm, and I want to make sure I can advance this. Uh, <coughs> okay. These images are on your screens, I assume. Yeah. So. There's usually okay. a couple second delay for that monitor to pick up, but we see it pretty readily. Commissioners, you should all have a window already open. If you don't, just click on Join Presentation. Is everybody uh, looking at the, uh, the, G. the plan that's up here? Yep. Everybody the G down at the bottom. There you go. There it is. Okay. Um, I'd like to start out by saying, uh, obviously, the image there, that's, that's where we are right now. And um, OCC uh, campus is right in the middle of, of Royal Oaks urban activity. Um, it's a very exciting location. They've been there for a long time. Um, and uh, especially over time, a lot of the, uh, uh, again, the, uh, the, the urban act activity and the growth of the city has come right down Main Street and even further south on Main Street. And right now we're located right where the railroad tracks cross, as you can see, in a little bit of a, of a I don't want to say dead zone, but let's say an empty zone in terms of, of that urban fabric. Uh, the railroad tracks run through. Um, there's a, 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 a number of parking lots, and they stretch from uh, Lincoln to uh, 6th Street along Main. And part of that empty zone is, of course, that city lot that's uh, right on uh, 7th Street and, uh, and Main Street. Uh, the other portions that, that create a little bit of that emptiness along that street are OCC's loading dock, OCC's mechanical and electrical building, and the back of the fly tower for OCC's theater. Um, so what we'd like to do is, is really take that and energize that zone. And, and what I've really described uh, illustrates the, the challenges that, uh, that our new building our new proposed building would have. There it is. So here's a, a larger scale site plan. 
the road along the top is Main Street, and uh, the existing campus is in purple, the new is in blue, and you can see that we're stretching a proposed new building from 7th Street almost all the way to Lincoln to really uh, energize, again, that part of the street that's, that's, a, that's a little empty right now. Also, the small blue square is where we're rotating the existing uh, mechanical electrical building off of Main Street and more toward the center of campus. Um, between the, uh, the, the larger blue area, that, that larger addition, and the smaller um, <coughs> a mechanical electrical building would be located our, uh, our new uh, loading dock area. Right now, it's right off of Main Street. Um, we propose to locate it right in the center of campus where it would be hidden from view and accessed from 7th. Going to even a larger scale, blowing this up, um, the, the large plan on top um, gives a more detailed plan with, uh, again, Main Street running along the top, uh, 7th Street uh, on the left, uh, Lincoln on the right. And what this depicts is uh, the desire of OCC to really push all the active areas onto Main Street. So the, what you see in yellow is, is, a, is a connecting um, interior passageway or commons corridor, which would be right along the glass that would face out onto the sidewalk of Main Street. To the left is a, is a dining room, which would be part of the culinary school. Um, the brown area represents an outdoor area where we'd really like to activate that corner of 7th and Main, um, so it would be a, a, a very friendly pedestrian area. Then off to the right, um, just off of the, the uh, yellow-colored corridor is a new gallery, a two-story high art gallery, um, which would cover up much of the existing um, uh, scene shop for the, for the existing theater. That scene shop has no windows right now. It's just a very tall wall, and we would cover up most of that with a, with a new uh, um, glass-enclosed art gallery. There would still be some greenery stretching out to Lincoln, um, that could be a sculpture garden associated with the gallery. So you can see kind of end to end, we're looking at really um, adding some, uh, some sparkle and some excitement and uh, a really, a really, a really a look to the, the pedestrian potential, potential of, that, uh, of that street. Um, here again at the larger scale, you can see the uh, um, Mechanical electrical building, that's that smaller smaller square um, just to the, uh, uh, on the other side of our um, loading dock area, which is completely um, uh, concealed from Main Street. Also, um, you can see the entry off of 7th again at a larger scale, um, which is a much more uh, subtle entrance into the, into the loading dock area. That represents the, uh, the first floor. As you go up to the second floor, possibly banquet space. Above that, a third floor would have uh, faculty offices, um, administrative area, and um, that would uh, um, be a, a three-story addition on, onto the campus now, which is predominantly uh, two-story buildings. Obviously, the fly gallery is, uh, is taller at the, uh, at the theater. Well, this is the existing condition, um, and this kind of really illustrates the empty zone. Um, we're looking uh, right down Main Street with uh, 7th Street on the right-hand side. There's the parking lot in question. Beyond that, the green building is the mechanical electrical building. Just beyond that is the entrance into the loading dock, and you can see the, uh, the theater with the, with the fly loft beyond that. Um, so that's uh, where we are now. Building is right there, and I'm going to go back again before and after, just because it's so dramatic. Um, and this, uh, the existing building, 
uh, you know, is, is, is set back far from the street, um, obviously doesn't have any, any entrances off of Maine. Here it's, it's uh, quite different. Um, we really propose a strong urban statement emphasizing that important corner of 7th Street and Maine. And um, you can see with the design of the building, we've tried to really hold that corner in an urbanistic way and at the same time open it up for, uh, for, for pedestrians and students. And running along Main Street, we've really wanted to, to activate the street life. A lot of glass on that first floor with the corridor running all the way down to Lincoln Street with the, uh, with the art gallery on the far side. Um, and you can see beyond, uh, as you go further down 7th Street, there's a, a very concealed entrance into the loading dock, which was pulled off to 7th. And beyond that, a new parking area. So we've increased the parking by 50 cars with this proposal also. This is the view um, directly uh, across Main Street. And you can see starting on the left, the uh, two-story high gallery space. Moving along that on the, on the ground level is the, uh, the glassed-in um, uh, corridor or uh, uh, in, internal uh, uh, community space that would, that would run along from the gallery all the way to the, to the uh, dining area on the far right. The dining area, obviously, the building opens up and uh, is that uh, inside, outside, kind of that outside room. And um, the, the building, we're looking at something that's uh, very articulated because this, it's, a long, it's a long building. It's, it's one full city block going from Lincoln to 7th Street. And we think it would be a really handsome addition to uh, certainly to the city. This is a view from the corner of 7th Street down at, at an eye level. It gives you a sense of the, of the, of the massing and proportion of the buildings. And from the other direction, I'm sorry, coming in closer, again, you can see how we're, we're trying to hold the city block and not really stay um, right on the sidewalk line, not peel back from it to, to make a, 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 a nice uh, enclosed urban statement, but yet still activate that kind of uh, like the shell of an oyster with the, with the pearl in the middle. Um, to really draw your draw your eye and draw your activity in, because we want wanted this building to be uh, really active, not just for the school but for the public also, especially with that culinary art um, uh, function that we have right in the corner of this building, and that's where the dining room would be would be located. From the Lincoln side. You can see that large mass of green, that's a two-story uh, art gallery, which covers up most of the, uh, uh, the windowless uh, back of the theater, um, stretching almost all the way to Lincoln, leaving some green area for, for sculpture. And um, in, a, in a future phase, we'd like to uh, reface the back of that uh, existing theater to match the, the skin of the new building. So it's all a proposal, obviously, right now, but uh, we think this is a very uh, strong response to the needs of the school and to the needs of the city and would be nothing but a really positive at uh, attribute to, uh, um, to life along uh, Main Street. We, we are really very excited about this, um, and uh, you can see, I mean, the before and after pictures, um, but it's really a tremendous opportunity for us to really help make this a college town, and that's one of the reasons we took the liberty to do the co-branded uh, 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 banners on the light posts um, along our property there in this picture. Um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, once this is constructed, we do, uh, we will, uh, reskin, they call it reskin, the remaining exterior of our campus as well as the parking garage. Uh, that was something that we actually originally had in place uh, to do a couple years ago. Uh, in fact, we were this close to signing the 
the contracts with the contractors, everything was bid out, but we put it on hold because we started to have this discussion internally about moving the arts down to Royal Oak. And uh, the one thing that we did not want to do is reskin uh, a campus only to tear some of that skin off and, and expand it. And so um, we're taking a very methodical planned approach. Uh, we're really very excited about the, the, the opportunities of what we have here uh, before you, and we are prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Well, first off, Chancellor, thank you. Amazing architectural work. I think the plan is a fantastic plan and just, you know, seems to be so well harmonized with, you know, what we're doing as a community uh, and what you're doing as an educational institution. So uh, for me, uh, very, very impressed. Um, but we will take the opportunity to ask you a few questions <laughs> if anybody right. has any. Uh, Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, Mr. Miller, I believe you said that there was 50 additional parking places, and I just wanted yeah. to get a better feel for the numbers and, and who will have access to those parking spaces. Uh, well, as architect, architects, we will create the spaces. The access will be up to Pete. Okay. <laughs> if, you, if you could start with the, the numbers, I mean, are you talking about the, you know, what we have right now is we have the community college parking lot, which is just to the uh, west of there, and then there's this parking lot, which is uh, the city parking. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how many parking spots there are total in that area, uh, but what I'd like to do is get a sense of what that number is now versus what it would be after the fact, and then we can talk about access. Do, Bob, do we know how many parking spots there are currently? There were 55 in the Royal Oak lot, 55, and then our lot has another 50. Yes. And then we're expanding it by? We're expanding our lot to be 75, so it's getting pretty close to the same numbers. So the picture that I advanced uh, on your screens, there's a little hard to, without pointing, um, to, to give you some relation to where I'm talking about, but you can see the lot where the cars are parked, the red car there uh, on the corner, that is owned by the city. Um, the lot that is west of that, as you had mentioned, is owned by the college. That lot would remain, but the area between, um, you know, where those trees are, um, uh, that would, then be converted over to parking, and we would be able to take the existing parking spaces that we currently have on that flat lot that is owned by the college and expand it by another 50 to 75 uh, spaces, which should help um, take some of the pressure off of losing that, that parking lot right there on the corner. Currently, our lot is open, and we do not have any plans on, on closing it or chaining it off uh, on the weekends, and so it would be open to the public to be so, used. So if I'm hearing correctly, we're basically, we, we currently have 55 in the city-owned lot, and with the changes that you are anticipating, there would be an additional 50 to 75, basically in that green space and just to the east of the green space. Yes, yeah, somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, do, do we have a sense of who utilizes this space now? If it's if it's people with, associated with the college or people associated with the businesses, the, the space that's currently owned by the city. Yes, um, that would be a better question, maybe for administration. I, I give you an idea, but they might have a better answer than I do. Okay, Commissioner Dubuck. Um, I think this is very exciting. I think, as the mayor said, it's I think well. Uh, aligned with what we're uh, you know, envisioning uh, as a city for our downtown and uh, very much appreciate the effort for the, the college and the city to, you know, kind of unify and find more synergies, um, whether it's regard to parking or public events or um, just making sure that people know that Royal Oak is, as you said, a college town. Um, so uh, I talked to the, uh, about this with my wife a little bit. She's incredibly excited because... <clears throat> No offense, the, the, the current design of the building is not the most up-to-date, not the most aesthetically pleasing in the city. No and, offense taken. And so this is, <laughs> this is uh, incredibly exciting, and, and, and the question uh, I'm, I've been directed to ask uh, 
is when can you do this? <laughs> what, <laughs> what is your plan? Pending we can work out you know, the, the details around the space. Sure. What, what, what's the timing look Internally, like? Internally, we've talked about this. It, you know, it depends on so many factors, and obviously planning takes time. Um, but with that being said, I, you know, I really think we could have, we could be under construction within two to three years. Um, so it's, it's not uh, tomorrow, but it's in the near future. Okay. It's coming. Okay. Thank you. Well, before my oldest graduates high school, so that's good. That's true. Yes. <laughs> and, and you brought up a good point. You know, one of the things that we've, you've heard us say is that Main Street is really your front door to the city. Uh, unfortunately, when the, the campus was constructed and we put the boiler room and all the utilities along Main Street, we made it our back door. Right. And we want to change that. So, Commissioner Perush. When this campus was constructed, uh, Mayor Barbara Hallman was mayor at the time, and she was very excited. She was one of the biggest uh, proponents of the college coming to the community um, and was thrilled to death that, that OCC had decided to build a campus in the community. But her thrill uh, was significantly, significantly diminished by the appearance of what is facing Main Street, that huge green behemoth. Um, nothing disappointed her more than having the entrance to the college go right across the street into the parking structure so that there was no connection between students on the campus and the rest of the downtown. And that was before the downtown took off the way it has now. So the opportunity for even more connectivity between the college with this design and the existing downtown is, is, even, is even more now than it was so many years ago. Um, but if she were alive today, she would be thrilled to see that you are, in fact, covering up that ugly green <laughs> building, uh, mechanical building that faces Main Street, um, because it, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't been an attractive neighbor, let's put it this way. The other good thing is that um, it, those of us who've been around for a little bit longer have always, unfortunately, had the impression that the OCC administration kind of felt that the Royal Oak Campus was your, your poor stepchild, that a lot of other campuses got a lot of attention and a lot of other improvements and a lot of other exciting things happening to them, but really nothing was happening here. And um, it was just kind of going along, going along. And the fact that now your administration and the Board of Trustees are actually um, recognizing that you do in fact have a jewel here that could be enhanced and become an even better um, contributor to the community is, is thrilling to us who as Jason said earlier you know for for a number of years um, we couldn't get anybody's attention I mean we couldn't get anyone to pick up the phone let alone have a conversation about what is going on on campus and how can we work together on some kind of project or whatever so um, the fact that you have, have demonstrated that you are um, in a very excited co-partner in the community, not only in this project, but in what other things that you're doing in the community, is terrific. It's a, it's a welcome change for those of us who've been around and have seen the other side of things over the time. And um, I think this is, a, this is a thrilling project, I really do. And uh, hopefully grandchildren will be <laughs> in a position, <laughs> once it is done, to kind of um, take advantage of it. The hill, hill our oldest, will, will be close. We'll be close. Mr. Gibbs. I'm really excited that we're going to be bringing a bigger, better culinary point of view to the city. I, I think it's something that it, it, it's been coming up for the past few years. It's been increasing the restaurants, the quality of the restaurants, and the number of restaurants has increased, and the variety is great. But I think this will be a perfect aspect, a perfect place or this this is going to be a perfect place for your fledgling chefs to um, get out there and you know sh shake things up try try some new things get involved maybe with some local restaurants or I, I don't know it, it seems like an endless opportunity right now so I'm looking forward to this and I love food so <laughs> I, I love to eat. I, I do too. And uh, um, I have to admit, you're, the chefs in this city have been incredibly supportive. Um, they have some tremendous ideas. Um, and one of the things that I'm hearing from them is that um, they really love the idea of our desire to take our fantastic culinary program to the next level <clears throat> and be a little bit more responsive to employer needs, the restaurant needs. 
and to be really creative um, and just kind of have that edge, um, which historically for culinary schools, they're, they're a little bit more, it is a little bit different. They're a little bit more traditional and you need that. Um, but your chefs are very creative and they've been very, very helpful in, in giving us some ideas on, on the direction that we need to move in with this. So appreciate the comments. Any other comments? Mr. Proust? Just, just one other thing to add. It, it, your, um, your arts program that has been on this campus for years, especially the ceramic arts program, it, it goes without saying that that program has trained a number of local community artists, and for that we are very, very grateful and appreciative. I know of three or four of them, and my cupboards are full of their pots and stuff. In <laughs> fact, Mayor Hallman's husband went through your program and was an artist for quite some time before he died and went through your program and, and became quite a skilled potter um, and was very happy doing that after Barbara died. So um, it, it, despite the fact that the, the image of the college we have hoped over time could be, be improved, your, your ceramic arts program in that, in that campus has always been a jewel in the community. So we're grateful that you hung on to that and, and are still supporting that activity. I feel to mention that um, the ceramics program has been located here historically at Royal Oak, um, as well as our, our photography labs. Um, and so those would remain. Um, they would uh, at some point get a, in a renovation as well. Um, but, you know, much to I think all of your surprise, we, we've had a theater here for a number of years. Um, but it was really just used internally. And I think the, if I remember correctly, I think it was Don and, and Mayor, we were giving you a tour of the campus and uh, you were shocked to see that we had a theater. In fact, I think that's where we, we had the idea of having the state of the city uh, right there on our campus. And so- um, actually, actually, I remember when you were showing it to us and yeah. you, you kind of went by the theater and I said, wait a second, <laughs> you're gonna build a theater too? <laughs> no, I said, that's oh, already no, there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, to your point, just opening this up to the public, there's just a tremendous opportunity, so. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, OCC has been a exemplary institution, educational institution in our community for some time. The programs that, you offering, that you're offering today, um, in our opinion, you know, just, you know, increase the fabric of our uh, life here in Royal Oak. I think we have a very exciting and energetic downtown you know, we open them up, we connect them a little bit better. Your students are gonna do well. Um, the patrons of our downtown are gonna do well. And just the other stakeholders that you mentioned, the outreach that OCC is doing with our restaurant community and other stakeholders. You start layering and compounding this uh, energy, it really has exponential potential. And I really believe that this is down the road gonna be a case study for all uh, community educational institutions to look to and see as a benchmark. Um, and so for, for us, I mean, I, I don't think we could ask for a better opportunity, better use of land, uh, and better partner moving forward. So we really do appreciate it. Appreciate that. Don Johnson. I would like to just second some of the comments that have already been made, uh, particularly those by Jason Gittinger during public comment. Uh, the relationship between the city and OCC until recently was pretty cold. Uh, basically, OCC didn't cooperate with us on anything, uh, and it's been such a breath of fresh air and so much fun to be dealing with Pete, uh, who's already taken a major role in Arts Beats and Eats. He's already brought uh, some of their theater program to Royal Oak. Uh, most recently, just a few weeks ago, Arthur Miller's All My Sons was presented here, and they did a fantastic job with that. It was chilling to watch that play. It was very, very, very emotional. Uh, the culinary arts program couldn't possibly be a better fit for Royal Oak. Uh, I can't think of anything I'd rather have them bring here. Uh, and we have arranged several meetings with our restaurant people, uh, with Pete and his staff, and I'll tell you that I haven't heard a bad word from any of our folks. Everybody's excited. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to having that happen. Uh, Pete's also presented some ideas for, uh, for when their, their folks are here and maybe some things for even sooner, uh, cooperating in terms of programs downtown, uh, possible 
things he's mentioned is they do have an ice sculpture program. Uh, he's expressed an interest in working with the farmer's market, possibly doing recipes using produce from the farmer's market and making those available, maybe doing cooking demonstrations. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're going to be able to work with with OCC. So I'm very, very pleased to see that happening. Chancellor Provenzano, anything to add? Uh, just, you know, again, to reiterate uh, my appreciation of, uh, of administration support along the way, as, as well as yours, and having uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, share our, our vision for the campus. Very good. Well, thank you for taking the time to come out tonight. We appreciate everyone from OCC taking time from your families and busy schedules to come out. Recognize that the support doesn't begin and end with, uh, you know, the chancellor, that it takes a whole community, and uh, we're very grateful for your support here tonight. Um, we do have a motion on we, the table, or not on the table, but a motion in front of us, Commissioner Dubuck. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, given all the enthusiasm, I am happy to uh, move the resolution directing staff to continue uh, discussions uh, with the college uh, and for the city attorney to uh, begin to prepare a purchase and development agreement for consideration. A motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there support? Supported by Commissioner Douglas. All right. Any further discussion? Anything we missed? Mayor. Commissioner Levasseur. I, I think this is a very positive uh, proposal here. I do believe we're getting put in the cart before the horse, though, with this resolution. Uh, there's a few things I'd like to see before we move forward on this. Uh, and, and that includes, uh, and I'll give the list, and this is more for, from staff than it would be from the college. Uh, but, but first, I, I want to make sure that we are uh, looking out for the taxpayers here. I'm, I think this is a fair price here, but the only way you know that is is to make sure that you have made the public aware that this <clears throat> lot is this this lot is in play. So if someone were to come forward to us and say, "I'll give you 1.1 million for it," that's information I'd like to know before we tell our city attorney go forth and put together a purchase agreement. Uh, so that's one concern I have. I'd like to know what our potential lost revenue is from the parking here. Uh, would like to have the, the numbers as far as the net change in service parking put in, uh, uh, you know, down on paper so we can you can see it and visualize it a little bit better. Uh, would like to know what the city has invested in this property as far as its acquisition, its maintenance cost uh, during the, uh, I don't know, 10, 10, 15 years, whatever it is that we've had this. Uh, and I'd also like to see the city look at uh, uh, what we can do to identify other uh, service par potential service parking uh, uh, lots or, or places that could be converted to service parking in our uh, business community to, to help in our downtown. Those are the, co the concerns, the things that I'd like to see, which would give me the comfort to say, yes, let's, yes, let's move forward on this. But I'd like to see that from, from our staff. Um, and that's basically, I think it's an absolutely wonderful proposal, but I do want to see these things from staff before we we give it the final thumbs up. My preference would be that we see the stuff before we tell the, the city attorney to get serious with drawing up a purchase agreement. But uh, at a minimum, I'd like to say that before we actually vote on that purchase agreement. Mr. Macy. So I just want to clarify that this is directing them to, to prepare one, but this is not our final vote on said purchase agreement, correct? Correct. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, once again, I'll just be supporting this wholeheartedly. I think from a strategic perspective, it's a no-brainer. Investing in education, you know, making sure our downtown opens up and remains relevant for everyone, helping foster a stronger uh, demand for our businesses uh, through education, and I think, um, you know, certainly filling a, a great quality of life priority in the arts, both in terms of uh, the culinary aspects, but as well as uh, in our uh, spiritual aspects, I guess. So, um, there's no other discussion. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay. Motion passes. What? All right. That's it. We're good. All right. So we'll see you uh, back again, I imagine, um, when we get to a point where we have a uh, Details of a potential agreement hammered out. We'll start working with Don and his team right away, and we'll, I'm sure he'll bring uh, a proposed agreement back to you in the near future. Thank you. And thanks again to everybody for coming out, and thank you for your, your vision. I mean, this is really...
really amazing. Okay. All right. This brings us to item number 13, which is the sidewalk exemption reviews for 5050 Delamere and 5025 Leafdale. Mr. Callahan. Um, yes, good evening. Um, uh, a little bit of background on this particular uh, issue. Uh, in 2016, uh, 5050 Delamere and 5025 Leafdale were granted exemptions from installing new sidewalk uh, on Parmenter and Leafdale. Um, at the time when we did our bus tour, it was discussed that um, staff had received uh, a proposal for the 5025 Leafdale property to redevelop. Um, and um, at the time we uh, knew site plans where there's no sidewalks, we make developers put those in. Um, it's one of the conditions of approval. Uh, needless to say, that property did not follow through on that proposal to develop the property. They came in uh, more recently with a new proposal. Um, the 5025 address is actually made out of two tax parcel IDs and uh, they're only developing one part of it. It just happens to be at the corner of Parmenter and Leafdale. Um, the 5025 address still exists. The uh, 5050 Delamere address still exists, but it's just a parking lot. Um, because the new development will be putting in sidewalks, there will be areas of no sidewalk to the north on Leafdale and to the west on Parmenter that connect this property to the nearest adjacent sidewalks. So we're bringing it back before the commission to determine whether or not they should rescind the previous sidewalk exemptions and ask them to install new sidewalks uh, in the coming year. Um, our resolution includes a date to complete those sidewalks by June 30th, uh, after which time, if they don't do that, um, we would do it under one of our sidewalk programs. So the ordinance requires the property owner to uh, have the opportunity to put the sidewalks in at their own cost with their own contractor first before we go ahead and do it at our cost, which we can't manipulate if we bid it out. So that's it in a nutshell. Questions for Mr. Callahan? Mr. Gibbs. So this is a commercial property then? Yeah, all, all of them are commercial properties. Okay. Or both of them, I should say. Three of them. Commissioner Dubuck. Yes, so it's clear the, the property owner was aware that the exemption was uh, based on the uh, agreement that, that they were going to develop it, and once they developed it, they're going to install sidewalk along the entire stretch. And I wouldn't say that they knew that at the time in 2016, but that was one of the discussions that the developer of 5025 Leafdale knew that he was going to be putting in sidewalks if he ever redeveloped that property. Um, he just did not know what it would look like or when it would occur. Okay. And when were the uh, uh, property owners noticed? Uh, uh, a little over two weeks ago. Okay. And I have talked with the owner of 5025 Leafdale, and his only objection was the way that I had worded who owned the, how the properties were, the history of this, and how it changed. Uh, the corner property now has a new address of 2500 Parmenter. But he was, uh, uh, I reminded him that if he wanted to come tonight and speak, he would have to do it at the public comment, which he did not. Okay, and they'll have until June to do it. Otherwise, it'll just be wrapped into our next round of sidewalk program at whatever cost we're getting. Yes. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Levat, sir. Okay, j just to be clear, r right now we, we're not aware of any concrete plans to develop this uh, in, in the short term by, by, this, by this property owner. Uh, the 5025 Leafdale is an existing building that has an existing driveway and a short section of the sidewalk does exist across his driveway, but he has no plans to change the use of that building or turn it into anything else that we know of. He's not submitted anything to the city or approached us with any plans. Commissioner Douglas? Uh, yeah, I remember going out when, when we as a commission hop on a bus and go out and look at sites where sidewalks are proposed, and I was one of the people who made a case for, develop, for delaying it, uh, feeling that once a developer wanted to start building, they'd wind up trashing the sidewalks that we had forced them to build. Um, and so, I mean, I think we made the right decision then, and I think, in fact, the property owner benefited from that decision, um, but it is now only right that they install the complete sidewalks to connect this development to the rest of the area. 
to make that in form of a motion? Yeah, good idea. I move approve, uh, approval of the resolution to rescind the sidewalk exemption for 5050 Delamere and 5025 Leafdale. Support? Discussion? Commissioner Perouche. It, I think it makes sense, especially since this is a pedestrian pathway, so to speak, to Myers, which is just right down the street, around the corner, um, for all of these housing developments that would be located off to the to the east here. Um, I mean, pedestrians, I've seen them when I drive to Meyer, um, are coming in this direction and then walking very close to the store. So the fact that this is going to be actually completed sidewalk as opposed to just dirt, um, which, which is what it is now, is, is a good thing. Any other discussion, comments? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. This brings us to item number 14, approval of November 2018 traffic committee resolutions. Mr. Callahan, and I see Mr. Godek. Thank you. Um, on November 27th, the Traffic Committee met. Uh, Chairperson Dan Godek uh, ran that meeting. Um, the minutes are attached and the backup information is attached to your packet. Um, five, uh, five items were brought before the uh, Traffic Committee. However, only four of them uh, had resolutions that were offered for the Commission to act on. Um, the four items that got that far uh, discussed were, uh, the first item was to review closing the crossover of Northwood Boulevard at Galpin Avenue, to which the traffic committee recommended not to do. Um, the second item was also with regards to Northwood Boulevard and installing um, speed limit signs at the east and west end of that road, which was recommended for approval. The third item uh, was uh, removing parking prohibitions on Samoset Road uh, between Woodward and Cooper. Uh, that was a street that had uh, a lot of parking restrictions due to being near the old jukebox barn. And the last item was uh, a request to install stop signs that the traffic committee recommended not to install on North Wilson at Houstonia. Questions for Mr. Callahan or Mr. Godey? Commissioner Perouche, sorry. Um, just real briefly, I'm familiar kind of with the area around Northwood and Galpin and um, you recommended not closing the crossover, which makes sense to me. I, I don't know how you could do that and, and not really mess up traffic in that area. But on the other hand, I'm curious as to what uh, were the concerns that were raised that caused this issue to be on the agenda? Is it the, the speed up and down Galpin going to Northwood? Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly what the issue might have been there, because it's kind of an awkward location. <coughs> it is. and. Um Full disclosure, I, I do own uh, a home on Galpin. Um, it's not my residence, but uh, um, a resident brought forth uh, some it, it, an issue where it's it's used as a cut through um, mm -hmm. when you're uh, a lot of people going through either Northwood or Webster and want to avoid uh, crooks. Um, they'll use Galpin, and um, Matt's study showed that uh, they typically go through at a pretty good uh, rate of speed. Because there's, uh, it's a straight shot. There's no intersections between Webster and Northwood. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to uh, the solution to try to close the crossover was decided to be a bad one. Um, and I think Matt uh, proposed that um, in the future uh, we could try to do some sort of traffic calming measures on that stretch mm -hmm. to try to get at least the the speeds down. The counts are not that bad. Um, a relatively low amount of traffic, but the speeds are high. So uh, that was the rationale. Okay, I, I can. The speeds are high everywhere these days, apparently. Um, but I can see why it might have been a problem there. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Commissioner Dubuck? Uh, yeah, I'm usually interested in in the minor minority report on any of these, but these appear to all be unanimous decisions by the traffic committee. Is that accurate? They are. All right. No minority report then. <laughs> Thank you. And they were all in line with um, the staff traffic committee recommendations as well. So then, 
Commissioner Dubai. I would now move uh, for approval of the traffic committee recommendations. Uh, with much gratitude to the committee that I know does their due diligence and works really hard to get these to us very thoughtfully. A motion by Commissioner Dubuck. We have support by Commissioner Douglas. Further discussion? Yeah, just once again, thanks. You guys have a tough job, you know. People have issues. They have proposals for solutions for those issues, and they're sometimes not always the best, but, uh, you know, you guys do your very best to help mitigate uh, the problems that fellow neighbors have. So appreciate it, Mr. Kodak. Great. Thank you. And we'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kodak. Yep. Um, this brings us to item number 15, approval of tobacco product ordinance amendments. First reading. Mayor Fournier and City Commissioners, for a number of years we have had an ordinance that prohibits the possession um, and use of tobacco products by minors. And tobacco products are defined as traditionally uh, they have been. Cigarettes, cigars, uh, chewing tobacco, snuff, things like that. Um, recently, the school district uh, contacted the police department and asked uh, if the city could possibly update um, its tobacco products ordinance to expand the prohibition to include e-cigarettes and also um, other nicotine products that are typically used for vaping. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the school district has apparently noticed an issue with a lot of vaping um, on school properties, um, at schools and um, if we can amend our ordinances this will just be another tool in the toolbox to deal with uh, the issue at the school district um, so we, we have drafted as a uh, proposed amendment to the tobacco products ordinance that would expand the definitions consistent with the request from the school district and we would recommend approval of the proposed amendment on first reading questions for Mr. Gillum Mr. Lavasser w one thing that had me a little bit puzzled was the, the language that there'd be a fine of not less than $25. And, and usually I think in terms of a, an ordinance or a statute say, stating a, a maximum fine as opposed to a minimum. And just want to get your insights into that. Um, well, first of all, the, the, the question that the chief and I discussed was whether or not it would be appropriate to have a violation uh, be a misdemeanor or a civil infraction, but given the fact that we're talking about minors, we thought that a civil infraction would be more appropriate than making it an arrestable offense, per se. Um, and then, <clears throat> typically what will happen with a, um, in the case of, of minors who are of, um, who are 17 or 18, or um, who, are, who are under the age of 18, the court will set a scheduled fine. Um, and so this was just a way of basically providing a floor for the scheduled fine that the court will eventually be setting for a violation of the ordinance. Is tobacco treated as, as a civil infraction as well? And, and with, with the same type of language? Um, the current ordinance makes uh, the possession or sale of tobacco products a misdemeanor. So we'd be changing that to a civil infraction with this ordinance. Okay, all right, so, so the, the, the possession would be the civil infraction, the sale, if I recall, would still be a misdemeanor. I'm sorry, that's correct. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so that would apply both to tobacco as well as to the, to the vape products. Vapor. Yes, that's correct. So anything in this, you know, umbrella of nicotine products. Yes. Yeah. As we define it in the ordinance. Okay. Any other questions? Comments. Commissioner Prush. I'll move approval of this on first reading. Motion by Commissioner Pruch. Is there support? Supported by Commissioner Douglas. Discussion. <clears throat> okay. With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. We'll bring this back for a second reading at our meeting next Monday night. Okay. That brings us to the end of our agenda. Notwithstanding any more important business for the betterment of our community, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Douglas. The, the business of the people being concluded for the evening, I move we adjourn. We have a motion by Commissioner Douglas to adjourn. Is there support? Enthusiastically supported by Commissioner Macy. Discussion on this motion in front of us. 
No discussion on the motion to adjourn. Okay. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. We are adjourned.